All right. So um, let's continue talking about circulatory lymphatics. Now, lymphatics serves mainly as the protective. Okay, so it accumulates all those um, immune cells and and whatnot um, that help to to fight the infection. But lymphatic system can also spread the infection uh, if it gets unchecked by the immune surveillance system. Now, um, one of the infections, the probably the most, the most, not the most tragic, but um, definitely very severe complications can arise if microbes enter the cardiac um, cardiac tissue. So, infection of the of the heart can be divided in three different types: the endocarditis myocarditis and pericarditis. So endocarditis is infection of endocardium, the endothelial lining of the heart. You can see it right here. Okay. But generally it manifests as the infection of the heart valves. Uh, the microbe spreads from the circulation onto the valves, endothelial cells that cover the valves, and causes the inflammation of the valves forming vegetations. You see those orange uh, dots or an accumulation of orange spots. Vegetations prevent the normal functioning of the valve, causing valvular stenosis and complete closure of the valve, and essentially a potential regurgitation of the blood um, and abnormal blood flow between different chambers of the heart. Endocarditis mostly is caused by gram-positive cocci, like Staph aureus, Streptococcus pneumonia, Streptococcus pyogenes. That's why infections of respiratory tract, like strep throat, uh, doctors pay so much attention to them. If they left untreated, the microbe can actually spread and cause cardiac inflammation, endocarditis, and in case of acute endocarditis, it is a very severe disease which requires a very quick antibiotic um, intervention and often requires surgery, the replacement of the valves, the diseased valves, for a healthy one. Subacute endocarditis uh, is the one that develops for a longer period of time. Uh, they both, acute and subacute, are often referred to as rheumatic fever. Okay, and um, in in some cases that may actually lead to congenital the the, the cardiac cardiac disease, the cardiomyopathy, the um, congestive heart failure, and so on. Infection of the muscle tissue of the heart is called myocarditis. You can see the myocardium, the healthy myocardium here, and this is the swollen myocardium, which reduces the volume of the ventricles, decreases the ability of the heart to pump blood, and may lead to the congestive uh, heart failure. The most common viral causative agent of myocarditis is the Coxsackie virus. Other viruses are associated with myocarditis too, but Coxsackie by far is one of the most common causes of myocardial failure, in uh, the most common infectious causes of myocardial failure. Uh, among bacterial infections, we talk uh, about Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the causative agent of the Lyme disease. Corinibacterium diphtheria, which the, the microbe causes diphtheria, and hemophilus influenza. We discussed it as the cause of bacterial meningitis. But essentially, <clears throat> these infections, C. diphtheria and H. influenza, start off at the respiratory tract and then spread elsewhere. By far, Borrelia burgdorferi is probably the most myocardium tropic infection, so un untreated Lyme disease 
unatte you know, unattended Lyme disease may lead to the development of myocarditis. Among fungal infection, Aspergillus is the most prominent cause of myocarditis, but we have to admit that fungal infections are mostly opportunistic. Okay, so immunocompetent folks don't have to worry about that type of systemic um, mycosis too much. Parasitic infections quite, uh, that cause myocarditis are quite interesting. Trypanosoma cruzi is the relative of Trypanosoma brucei that we discussed just half an hour ago. Trypanosoma cruzi is most commonly found in the um, South, Af South America. Sorry. So this mastigophore, this flagellated protozoan, is transmitted uh, via sand flies. I think it's, yeah, no, Lishmani is the sand flies. Uh, Trypana, so it's transmitted by one of the flies or mosquitoes in the South America, but essentially <clears throat> it eventually enters the circulation, okay, and makes its way to the myocardium, and causes myocarditis, inflammation. So it's not trypanosoma per se that causes the disease. It's the inflammatory response to it which may cause myocarditis. These two helminths, Ascaris lumbricoides and Trichinella spiralis, very interesting in terms of how they cause myocarditis. Ascaris lumbricoides is the nematode that is that can be found usually in the intestines of affected people. But when sometimes larvae of um, Ascaris lumbricoides penetrate the walls of intestines and start quite literally crawl out, reaching to other organs, including heart. They burrow into the cardiac wall and look, if you have a worm in the heart wall, your heart will it's not going to properly function. Okay? Trichinella spiralis is another nematode which also, in, this infection is also via the, the oral route with the consumption of undercooked meat. But this nematode actually burrows through the walls of the intestine and enters the muscle tissue all over the place, not only cardiac but also skeletal muscle. And um, a trichinellosis often leads to myocarditis and the heart failure in the long term perspective if it is left untreated. <coughs> Sorry. Once myocarditis is established, there's not very many things you can do about it. With the virus, there are no specific antivirals against Coxsackie. With a bacterial infection, you can treat with antibiotics, but usually the course is pretty long because <clears throat> heart involvement, heart involvement um, implies the systemic infection. Parasitic infection, there are some antiparasitic and antihelmintic drugs, but usually the damage is already done. So a damaged myocardium will never go back to normal, it will never pump blood as good as it used to. So essentially the treatment would include mostly <coughs> inflammation reducing agents like corticosteroids and very synotropic agents, the ones that increase contractility of the cardiac muscle. Pericarditis is the infection and essential inflammation of the pericardium, connective tissue that surrounds the heart. It leads to the sound known as the friction rub when the wall of the heart starts to rub against the pericardial cavity. Accumulation of fluid called pericardial tamponade and generally chest pain. The causative agents are very similar. Coxsackie virus that I mentioned before. Bacterial um, gram-positive staphylococci, H. influenza, streptococcus, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Although I must admit, if mycobacterium tuberculosis is found, 
in the pericardium means that tuberculosis became systemic and it probably affects other organs like bones and maybe brain. Okay. Different fungi can cause it. Um, now, this is quite interesting. You can see that for fungal infection, it's a little harder to get into the muscle, but easier to get into the pericardium. So, infections like histoplasma capsulatum, different species of aspergillus, candida albicans, coccidioides imitis, all those fun fungi can cause inflammation uh, of the pericardium. Treatment, uh, if any antibiotics are available for that particular disease, they will, they will be in a treatment. But it's mostly anti-inflammatory drugs to limit the inflammation, limit the fluid accumulation in the pericardial cavity, and limit the pericardial tamponade. This is what excites students most of all. This is plague. It's a gram-negative rod which is quite unique. It's called Yersinia pestis. This is the microorganism that actively multiplies in the blood, causing very high fever, confusion because of inflammation and impaired blood supply to the brain, chills, which is associated with high fever, frequently gastrointestinal symptoms, and respiratory alkalosis. Also, low blood pressure due to the inflammatory cytokines that dilate blood vessels. Okay. Most of those infections, and you can think about, think about plague. Is that bad? Yes. It's bad. It's really, really bad. So this is zoonotic infection, which means humans are, again, deadened hosts. Plague did not evolve together with the humans. There were sort of spillovers into the human populations. So, a uh, reservoir for it, different types of rodents. The ones in the wild, in, in the wild these rodents are groundhogs, marmots, so when fleas that normally are ectoparasites, of those rodents jump fleas the biological vectors when they jump from rodents onto the dogs or cats it can be transmitted to humans or rats for that matter eventually fleas just have to make their way from the wild animal into the house onto the human the flea bite essentially causes the transmission in different types of plague now we all know about plague epidemics, right? There were several of them. For example, in 6th century um, AD, about 100 million people died, and it was a considerable portion of the world population. In the epidemics of 13th, 14th century in Europe, plague destroyed about, according to different estimations, third to a half of European population. Interestingly enough, the subsequent two epidemics of plague in Europe um, led to much less percentage of mortality. 15% and then about 1%. Any ideas why? It's like 13th century, it's 35%. Population die in, I think it was 16th century or 17th. It's something like 15% uh, of population die. And then later in 19th century, it's 1%. Mm, more <laughs> precise. Not really the vertical. No, no, no. Who died? Right, but um, yes, susceptible people. You see, not everybody got infected. Some people didn't. So essentially, it was 
very cruel, but natural selection. It's selected for genetic um, resistance to plague. Okay, and we probably still carry those genes. So although plague is awful, you know, and I remember when I was a kid, I watched the the old Soviet movie. It was like a, it's called a fairy. It was called a fairy tale. There was nothing fairy about it. It was freaking scary, um, really scary. I couldn't sleep at night. And they had an episode when two children and they like guardian get into the plague infested city and there's a woman playing a part the actress she was playing plague god that was scary i mean the whole the whole grim representation i think was pretty accurate now did you see the plague doctor the picture of the guy with the nose Yeah, so this dude, this dude is wearing a mask. So the idea was that he would scare the living daylights out of the plague, right? But actually it played well because they wore um, uh, some cloth to cover up their they, they face to, because it was so smelly, all those dead bodies slowly rotting that they had to they had to wear it. So it prevented spread of respiratory plague on them. And those long clothes probably prevented some of the fleas to jump on them and bite them. So in fact, those plague doctors... Now, here's the double-edged sword. They sort of prevented themselves, but imagine this. You have a doctor that enters into the household <laughs> that has plague and then walks out and kind of hangs out with other people. So this doctor becomes to an extent a passive carrier of the infection. He looks like Nick Reaper too. Huh? The way, the way that he holds Nick Reaper yeah. is sickle and Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only thing is doesn't have what what's that? Uh, a sickle. A sickle, yes. Now plague has three different forms, okay? Pneumonic, bubonic, and septicemic. Bubonic is the mildest one. You can see the bubos here, and here you can see the, the uh, microscopy of the infected uh, lymph, lymph node uh, with the stroma, the uh, white blood cells, the uh, macrophages, uh, probably neutrophils, and you see the rods here, your senior rods. So bubonic plague, uh, bubo forms next to the flea bite, okay? Lymph node becomes necrotic, swollen, and blackish, okay? Now, if bubonic plague has the probably the least death rate among all of them because it can be restricted um, and it's fairly easily to diagnose. You can just look at the, at the bubo. That makes sense? If it becomes systemic, um, it's lethal in one or two days. It is awful. Pneumonic plague, so when we say pneumonic, we don't really refer to specifically pneumonia, we refer more to the transmission route. If there is a, a respiratory transmission, it helps the infection to establish a septicemic form. So respiratory form of the plague usually is much more deadly. Does that make sense? So, uh, you can see the reported cases of plague. It's pretty common. It's actually endemic, or should I say enzootic. Uh, it exists in uh, chipmunks and groundhogs and squirrels and whatnot in southwestern United States, actually all western United States, m tending to be more in the southern California and uh, Arizona. Okay. There is a vaccine that people who work with the plague have to take and 
Treatment is pretty effective. Different types of broad-spectrum antibiotics like tetracycline or fluoroquinolones can, can effectively treat plague. The only problem is the timely diagnostics. Okay. Now, uh, by the way, wanted to ask you a question. We discussed the biosafety level containment. Remember? I mentioned like BSL-3, BSL-4. So BSL-1 is pretty much what we do here. BSL-2 is when you have to work in the hood. But you don't have to wear any protective gear, except for the gloves. BSL-3 is when you have to wear a hood, a Tyvek suit, but it's not isolated air supply. So you have a filtration unit on the back. And BSL-4 <clears throat> is the one where you have the hose with the clean air that gets in your costume. You're completely sealed from the environment. So you understand, so BSL-4 is the highest level of protection. Plague, which level of biosafety containment do you think it is? Three. Why three? Why not four? And treatment, yes. So even if you get exposed, so pretty much for pathogens that we don't have vaccine or effective treatment are automatic and they are lethal. BSL-4, like Ebola. Pathogens that we have vaccine for or treatment for, BSL-3, sometimes they actually get downgraded to BSL-2. Like influenza is BSL-2 because it's not really lethal. Does that make sense? Tularemia or rabbit fever. Uh, you can see the, the tularemia, um, the coccobacilli here, the electron micrograph. And it is um, endemic, although cases are rare in the United States. It is called also rabbit fever, or caused by gram-negative Franchisella tularensis. This microbe is extremely infectious. By extremely, I mean that the infectious dose um, can be as low as one micro. Extremely infectious. Usually, people get infected when they skin the game, mostly like when they hunt rabbits and skin them. It can be transmitted by the by the blood route, or sometimes you know, when, especially in more rural settings, when people do the the lawn mowing with the tractor thing, and there's a dead animal like dead squirrel or dead rabbit, and they run over it, they essentially aerosolize it, okay, so they can inhale it. There's also it's also transmitted by the bites of the fly, okay. So multiple routes of transmission. It spreads systemically very quickly. It causes pneumonia, uh, skin ulcers, um, sore throat. So it's respiratory symptoms, skin symptoms. Um, develops very quickly. Can be fatal in 48 hours if it's not treated properly. It responds well to antibiotics. Okay, there is a vaccine. It's not available for the general public. It's live attenuated microbe. Um, I don't remember the strain. This is the BSL-3 pathogen. So you have to work with it under the certain, under the certain level of biocontainment. And it's also a select agent. So potential bioterrorism agent, which means Pain in the ass for the researcher who works with it, because you have to take to account for each and every sample of that. Lyme disease is fairly common. This map um, shows you the transmission of Lyme disease and doesn't show it in Ohio, but shows in Pennsylvania. Don't think that ticks, when they you know they they crawl through the ground and they see the the Welcome to Ohio Science and no, I'm not going there. I stay in Pennsylvania. No, of course not. Ticks are feeding on animals, okay, and then they feed on humans. So uh, mostly it's exodus ticks. Uh, I don't remember which one. It's 
Ricinus and Persil caddis are in Europe. I don't remember the species of exotic stick that transmits it in the United States. So it's the diderm spirochid. It's not gram positive or gram negative. It's it's different. Okay. And the main reservoir are rodents. So ticks feed in rodents. And then how do you get a tick? Where do they where do they sit? In the grass. That's important. They don't jump. They don't wait for you on the tree and then when they see you, they jump on you from top. No, they're in the grass. You may ask, how do they end up behind your ears, in your eyelid, in your groin, you know, armpit? They crawl up. And you're not going to notice, no. When they crawl up, they're not going to notice. So if you go into the tick infested area, pants in the socks, uh, t shirt in the pants, and tick spray everywhere. Now we have very effective sprays, the repellents that work wonders against ticks. Okay? The um, number of infected ticks is fairly low, so um, it's not the transmission is not very frequent. Okay, so this biological vector, when it bites you, eventually uh, the so-called bull's eye rash appears. You can see it here. It's probably the most characteristic symptom of uh, Lyme disease. By the way, Lyme. It's not a name of a person. It's a town in Connecticut where this disease was, was actually discovered. Okay. Eventually, when bacteria spread systemically, it causes meningitis, it may cause meningitis, may cause different neurological symptoms like stiff neck, uh, flaccid paralysis, um, joint pain. It can be treated. Um, by antibiotics, but the course of antibiotics is long. You can see that it may be as long as three, four weeks, which is for bact systemic bacterial infection is long. So it's really hard to eradicate. The problem with that infection as well is that when you get treated, and if you develop neurological sequelae already, doesn't mean that you're going to recover completely. So some patients, even though they are clear of bacteria, they still have neurological symptoms. This is the example of transmission cycle for uh, the, that, the exodus tick. So rodents, bitten by the larva of the tick, larva develop into the nymph. Nymph can feed either the human transmitting the, t the, the infection or in the deer. Okay? Adult ticks, adult ticks have to take a blood mill from the deer, develop. Adult ticks hatch eggs, and the cycle continues. Okay, so this is how ticks look like. So that's larva, that's nymph, that's adult tick. You have to appreciate. You see how small it is? It's really hard to not notice one. Okay, so when uh, you you come from the forest and you know you search for the ticks. You may not notice one. Not until they take the blood mill. Because when they take the blood mill, they become the size of the nail. They're really huge. They accumulate enormous amount of blood. In this case, you will notice them for sure. But the problem is they may just detach. How do you remove the tick? Any ideas? Yeah, you have to be careful though, so the head doesn't stay. Sometimes uh, they you suggested to, to make a little uh, loop around the tick and just carefully pull it, pull, 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 pull it out. You may have heard suggestion to pour some oil on the tick. Ever heard of it? Huh? But we never tried the match one. We tried the um, we tried the the oil, like vegetable oil, to suffocate the ticks. So it, it supposedly prevents them from breathing. 
This is the insect. They can hibernate for 20 freaking years. Good luck with suffocating. We spent like a quarter of bottle pouring over that tick. And then we just pulled it out. Okay, so that's, that's the easy route. Again, try not to um, leave the head in. If you're curious if the tick has a Lyme disease, what do you do? Yeah. Uh, if you uh, usually, when when does this happen? The tick bite usually. No, I mean day of week. Yes, when doctors are not available, that's when it usually happens. So anyway, usually cannot come to um, physician right away. Put it in like Ziploc or any type of container. Put it in the freezer. That's fine. Then you can take it to the doctor, and doctor can either send it to CDC local health and human services place where they can sequence it and they can tell if they have Lyme disease or not which doesn't really help because if they do you don't you're not necessarily going to develop this infection okay mono you heard of it I bet it's the infection that is mostly caused by Epstein Barr virus see the structure here, it's a large DNA virus, double-stranded DNA virus. Uh, it's a herpes virus, sort of a cousin of herpes simplex and CMV. Actually, cytomegalovirus, the CMV, which is better herpes virus, can cause the, the similar sickness. Okay? Um, we also call it a kissing disease. It's transmitted by bodily fluids and Often, this virus is often contracted um, in a childhood. It's actually quite rare for a person to grow up without having CMV or Epstein Barr. Uh, in some regions, at some age, so prevalence can reach 90 and even 100 percent. So it's very, very common uh, infection. Uh, and after the incubation period, the symptoms are regularly sore throat, okay? Um, enlarged lymph nodes in the neck, okay, uh, throat exudate, skin rash, and an in, uh, increased number of mononuclear cells, the, mo the neutrophils, okay. That's why we call it mononucleosis. Does that make sense? Um, now, by itself, mono is an unpleasant obviously unpleasant infection, right? But it, it goes away. In some people it is actually completely cleared. But in most cases, Epstein-Barr virus enters latency, as does CMV. Epstein-Barr becomes latent in B cells of your immune system. CMV resides in monocytes. I find it highly ironic that those those infections reside in the cells that are supposed to take care of them. Um, CMV becomes reactivated when monocytes respond to inflammation. And what do they become in response to inflammation? Macrophages. Exactly. That's the trigger for CMV as well. CMV is produced by... Uh, differentiating monocytes when they differentiate in the macrophages. EBV resides in the B cells and usually doesn't cause anything for a lifetime, although in some people causes um, Hodgkin, Hodge, pff, Hodgkin's lymphoma, sorry, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and sometimes when it enters the epithelium of the nose, so-called nasopharyngeal carcinoma. For some unknown reason, we don't really know why, those infections, those manifestations of Epstein-Barr, nasopharyngeal carcinoma and um, Hodgkin's lymphoma are very common in certain regions of Africa. That's where the virus was discovered by Epstein and Barr. Okay, now Epstein was male, Barr was female. Just letting you know. 
So um, CMV doesn't seem to cause any long-term pathogenesis in immunocompetent folks. However, there are some reports that CMV may be a strong, may have a strong association with cardiovascular disease and serve as oncomodulator. What I mean by that? It means that CMV by itself doesn't cause cancer, but it facilitates the cancer development. See the difference? So it's not like HPV, but it helps cancers to develop. There's actually a, a, a speculation that CMV may be involved in the development of glioblastoma, the tumor of the brain that arises from the glial cells. And I am very proud that I'm CMV negative. We had a lab that worked with CMV and to grow the virus, they got to have cells. These ones, monocytes. Now, where do you get human monocytes? From humans. What are the most accessible humans in the research institution? Other researchers. So they called me once in about two, three months. They told me, dude, can you give us a pint of blood? So I walked upstairs and we were chatting while they were sucking the blood out of me. And they actually did that with many people and then they tested monocytes to see if if people were CMV positive or negative. I was negative, so I'm very proud of it. I donated it two or three times. And the good thing, don't have to report it, so I can kind of donate blood officially and do it like a, a side project with that lab because it was all like... I had to sign a consent form, of course. But nobody cared if I donated like two weeks ago. I'm healthy enough for that. Hemorrhagic fevers. That's my, I wouldn't say second love. Remember we talked about the encephalitic viruses? St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile. Some of their relatives, like yellow fever and dengue, belong to the same genus the flavivirus. So you can see six viruses here that all cause hemorrhagic fevers. Before we proceed any further, I want to clarify on what the hemorrhagic fever is. So hemorrhagic fever is when um, infection, the, the severe infection, manifests with multiple hemorrhages, bleedings into the tissue. Does that make sense? Okay, now when someone represents, you know, someone presents Ebola as the infection after which you're going to have like blood coming from all your orifices, it is not true. It's not going to come like, you're not going to bleed from your eyes or ears, just mouth, no. But it's going to be a lot of hemorrhage in the tissues, which is no better. That make sense? Some of these infections are biphasic, some of them are monophasic. So some of them will have two different stages. Some of them will have one with a prodromal period that leads to the development of full-blown hemorrhagic fever. So yellow fever. This is the, the virus that I worked on for more than two years, um, trying to find the immunological determinants uh, in this virus, why we have, how we managed to end up with a vaccine, okay? Uh, you can see almost a billion people are at risk. It affects the entire South America, and as it becomes colder, you know, risk becomes almost non-existent, and Central Africa. It is mosquito-transmitted virus, Okay, so mosquitoes are biological vectors. There are several cycles. So there's an urban cycle. It's called an urban yellow fever, and mosquito transmits the virus between the human and another human. There is an intermediate cycle where the transmission happens between non-human primates. And there is a sylvatic cycle, okay, which also involves non-human primates. The 
vector that transmits is the mosquito called Edis aegypti. It can be Edis aegypti, actually, Edis albopictus can do it as well, uh, but rarely. Now, this is the biphasic disease. First phase is what we refer to as flu like symptoms, nothing like flu like symptoms. It's very severe. And in many people, this is it. But in some percentage, in some percentage, this infection causes systemic hemorrhages, jaundice, and if left untreated and uncared of, death. It's, it's very high mortality rate. This is the picture actually of Edis aegypti here. And that's the virion of yellow fever. I find it like, fascinating. Now, before we go any further, I want to ask you a question. You see how uh, the regions that are affected by yellow fever. Why southern South America, South Africa are not affected? What determines which region is at risk and which is not? To an extent, but temperature, but what it defines? The mosquito. So if mosquito is present or not, if there is no vector transmission, there's the, if there's no vector, there's no transmission. So like here in the southern, like in Argentina and southern Chile, it's too cold. There are winters. Okay, it's really, it, it can be freezing there. Okay, so mosquitoes just don't elevate to the... Um, levels that require for transmission. Um, South Africa, prob mosquitoes probably just, there are probably other species of mosquitoes that may uh, compete. North Africa is very desert, okay? Not very many mosquitoes in the desert, you can imagine. Okay, so it's savanna and jungles here. Um, so the more, do you know if Aedes aegypti are present in the U.S.? The mosquitoes, Aedes, Aedes aegypti, these mosquitoes, are they in the U.S.? Yeah, everywhere. Why don't we have yellow fever? Yeah, but think about this. If, if there, we have yellow, imported yellow fever cases, people... People go abroad, pick up yellow fever, come over here. All you need is mosquito. We have mosquitoes to establish the cycle. Why cycle is not getting established? Hmm? Ever been to Texas? Can't imagine. It's not really freezing there. I'll go. Have you been to Texas? No one? Any other southern state in the summer? How people live there in the summer? That's, well, for the sun, but car inside, car inside. It's, well, I'm going to tell you, in Louisiana, the worst part of the day when I walk from parking lot to the work building and back. Those are worst parts of the day. Because it's it's 100, it's 90% humidity, and you're miserable for two minutes, but you are miserable. Like here, you pick up people because it's too cold. I used to pick up my wife because it's too hot. Okay? So, uh, people don't spend time outside. We have ACs. If you're in Africa, you don't have AC. And even if you're inside, you know, uh, do you know the, the shotgun houses? Have you, uh, oh, south, southern thing. In the south, you go in south, there's a so-called shotgun house. It's a house with a long hole, whole way through it. Which means you can open the front door and the back door and create a draft. They were built in the time where there were no ACs available. Okay, and kind of created a little bit of circulation. Okay. But if you open the doors, mosquitoes are welcome. So that happens in, in here, in 
fairly poor countries, developing countries of South America and Africa, mosquitoes are welcome. So it doesn't matter whether you're outside or inside, you still are exposed to mosquitoes. Okay, that's why the transmission can be effectively established. We do have a vaccine, and I'm proudly vaccinated against yellow fever. I worked with that, for God's sakes. It's very effective vaccine, extremely effective. Max Tyler developed it in um, 37 by passing the wild virus, the wild yellow fever virus, through rabbits and monkeys, or ra mice and monkeys, different animals, like 200 times. And he came up with a strain called 17D, which doesn't cause disease in humans. But interestingly enough, if you inject it intracranially in the brain of mice, it will cause paralysis. It will cause clinical disease of mice. By modern standards, this vaccine would never be approved. But it's been used since 30, well, 40s. And it showed that it's so effective and actually so safe in humans. Why go for any better alternative? We do have maybe one, two vaccine-associated hemorrhagic cases every year. But it's from pretty much millions of people who are vaccinated. So it's quite, quite, quite interesting, I think. Um, dengue. Um, probably the most threatening vector-borne illness in the world. <coughs> so this red area shows you the um, countries with emerging dengue fever. And this actually shows you some other examples of the transmission. Ah, oh, no, no, that's going to Okay, so that's for dengue. Okay, see how many countries are affected. And of course, again, as we discussed, Pennsylvania versus Ohio. Like if you have dengue in, oh, and here I fail with my no, it's Egypt to the south, it's going to be Sudan, I think. This is Chad. So, I mean, the, not that they like fly to the border. Oh, no, we're going back. Of course, you know, we talk about maybe transmission went unreported. So, it's also a flavivirus. It's positive RNA single stranded, transmitted by the same mosquitoes as yellow fever, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. It's definitely, it definitely has a human reservoir. We don't know if it's zoonotic. I personally strongly, strongly suspect that it is zoonotic, but we couldn't establish if there's any animal that carries it. I, I think monkeys. The first stage of infection is mild. Actually, dengue stands for breakbone fever. So mild includes myalgia. What's myalgia? Muscle pain. So it feels actually like old bones in your body are aching. So if you consider it mild, think twice. In most people, the primary infection resolves completely and they are fine. But the interesting thing is that dengue has four different serotypes. And if a person is infected second time with a different serotype, like first infection with, was with serotype 2 and second was with serotype 4, secondary infection can lead to the hemorrhagic fever or shock syndrome with fairly high death rate, up to 30%. Now there are vaccines against dengue that are under, you know, clinical trials. Some of them, most of them do not prevent the infection because for serotypes it's really hard to make effective vaccine against each of them. But um, they at least reduce mortality, especially in children, which is great, which means person probably will develop some symptoms, some disease, but will not experience the shock syndrome. Does that make sense? So it doesn't prevent the infection, but it reduces mortality. 2.5 billion people are at risk. There's 
Florida is not included here. But believe me, Dengue is in Florida. Um, five, uh, half a million cases of hemorrhagic fever, 22,000 deaths annually. It is really a lot. For vector-borne disease, it is a lot. Okay? One interesting thing here on the map I want you, want you to look at. Here you have uh, transmission of dengue before 1960. See yellow here, the, the Indostan Peninsula, uh, Thailand, um, Myanmar, Vietnam probably. And here you have Venezuela. That's it. No other countries report transmission. And then up to 1960, it starts to spread worldwide. What happened in 1960? Oh no, commercial flights were way before that. Think about sheep. Sheep would also transmit. What would cause such uh, a vast expansion of the vector-borne infection? What should also expand? Transmitted by mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Why mosquito population started to expand? There are two ways, right? Either had a lot of mosquitoes, and then they become like ups, just incredibly huge, or you had very little, and then they returned to normal. There you go. DDT was banned. So mosquitoes had best day in their lives. They short two weeks lives when DDT was banned. They started to, to spread all over the place. Okay? And actually, <clears throat> all the problems with mosquito, with, with vector transmitted diseases, started to arise from the time the DDT was banned. Okay? So it's kind of an interesting story here, an interesting term. Is DDT toxic? Yes. The answer is absolutely yes. It's toxic, it's teratogenic, it can cause cancer. Yes. Should we use it? How? Window sills, yes. So, you, you know, when people... One, one, one thing that I want, that I would like you to kind of keep in mind when people are very extreme like we should ban DDT like once and for all never mm -hmm. it had some benefits not when you spray it over the over the city no but when you apply it like okay mouse traps or uh, the cockroach traps if you're gonna if you lick them you're probably gonna die okay but it doesn't mean we're going to ban those chemicals that are in those traps that kill cockroaches, right? Okay, like, uh, did you, I don't know if you ever used the, the mouse poison. Yeah, you're probably, if you eat it, you're probably going to die. Okay? We had a, we had a, a sugar ant problem in the backyard in Louisiana. People came over and, and put some insecticide, and they told us, Watch small kids. They think it's a candy. It's like little pellets. They think it's a candy. They start to eat it. You're going to end up in the hospital with poisoning. So there's no other way to treat. So, I mean, there are poisons. We just have to not eat them. Chikungunya. I really love the name. Okay. Um, the name chikungunya means bent up. So, this disease causes the inflammation of the joints. Severe inflammation of the joints, rheumatic symptoms, okay? Uh, it's a self-resolving virus, which means uh, there were very, extremely few, rare deaths reported. Um, I think they are not in tens, but in ones. So, like, five people died of it. 
very extremely few but it's very widespread it now affects it started off on the reunion island uh, I think it's right here east of Madagascar and then it spread through the Central Africa South America eventually reached the United States now in the United States it's not everywhere it's in Florida I think it's in Texas as well because of the climate but it's not going to spread any up north um, we have no vaccine we have no treatment and nobody's going to make it because people who are affected are not going to pay for it they're poor okay but it's really really widespread Ebola a little shameless plug If you will Google my name on YouTube, you not only end up with a channel where these videos are getting uploaded, <clears throat> you are also going to see a couple of videos. I did a, a presentation here at Lakeland. First presentation was on Ebola. I shared the honor with uh, Dr. Nussbaum. Second was on Zika virus. So Ebola is the hemorrhagic fever that is zoonotic, transmitted most likely almost 100% certain from bats and it's endemic to Central Africa you see it here um, I know that you cannot read it's kind of it, those maps represent so this map represents the most frequent places of transmission for Ebola virus <clears throat> you see that it's uh, uh, mostly Western Central Western Africa um, Transmission is probably accidental because people in Africa eat bushmeat. So they hunt bats and they carve them open and they expose them to the bat's blood and expose themselves to Ebola virus and that's the route of transmission. Make sense? Okay. Then virus can be transmitted between humans via bodily fluids. Okay. And now we are almost certain that there is a, a sexual route of transmission because virus, the Ebola, Ebola virus, was found in the sperm uh, something like 90 days after the resolution of the disease. So it's probably, there is probably a sexual route involvement, although it is absolutely not a dominant route. That makes sense? So it's not that outbreak, the last outbreak, okay? that was um, in 2014-2015 it affected I think f like 45,000 people uh, about 15,000 of them died okay it was mostly by the bodily fluid transmission now this is a great ex and no respiratory transmission whatsoever okay Ebola is not transmitted respiratory uh, some people may argue that there was a study and indeed there was a study of uh, attempt of transmission of Ebola virus via the respiratory route. Now, what is the respiratory route? Respiratory route is when I talk to you, there is a, an aerosol formed. If you inhale that aerosol and get infected, then yes, there is a respiratory transmission. Okay? Now, this study was designed a slightly different way. There were pigs in a huge room infected with Ebola and there were monkeys in the what you might call it the cages the sides of the room so they had no direct contact with pigs whatsoever so far makes sense and pigs were infected monkeys were uninfected After several days some of the monkeys got infected as well now a little thing Pigs are not the cleanest animals. They don't go to the restroom and they don't wipe their butt, okay? They, they shit where they leave, they pee where they leave. And they kind of jump in, in all of that. The room was cleaned every 24 hours. Then they had plenty of time to aerosolize any virus that they shed in feces and urine. And actually, authors of that study acknowledged it. <clears throat> so it may have been by aerosolization of, say, urine, <clears throat> sorry that monkeys inhaled or imagine if there's such a huge amount of virus existing in in the form of like 
aerosolized uh, uh, fe fecal matter and it lands on the mucous membranes of the nose or the mouth, it's not a respiratory transmission. It's a fluid to mucous membrane. There are actually very strict criteria, which means, as I mentioned, if I have Ebola and you don't, when we leave this class, you still don't have it. I'm not going to transmit it to you. Does that make sense? Uh, mortality of that disease may vary. Some suggest that um, it can be as low as 10% if proper care is provided. We're not talking about the drugs. We're not talking about the antibodies or anything, a vaccine. We just talk about blood fluids to avoid dehydration. You can find that in some outbreaks, the mortality rate was 100%. What does that mean? In a small village, seven people get sick, seven people die. They probably didn't receive the proper care. We don't know about any asymptomatic Ebola cases, and there is a strong suspicion that there are asymptomatic Ebola cases. Okay? The level of mortality that we observed in Africa was mostly socioeconomic. Okay? Lack of proper infrastructure, lack of hospitals, lack of trade personnel, lack of Come on, gloves, IV lines, sterile gowns, so nothing to take care of the patients. The best, the socioeconomic aspect of that disease is best exemplified by uh, patients that arrived to states. There were two people who died in the United States of Ebola. One was uh, the Texan, originally from Liberia, who returned from, from Liberia who lied on the uh, patient history that he was in Liberia. He said he wasn't. He lied about the fact that he actually cared about Ebola patient. So when he was finally admitted, and he was finally checked for Ebola, it was too late. The disease was too progressed. Another person was the, the doctor, medical profession, professional, who actually worked in Liberia took care of patients, acquired Ebola there from patient and was airlifted and, and uh, brought to Omaha, University of Nebraska Medical Center. But again, it was the disease was too progressed and he died. Every other person in the U.S. who acquired disease was treated successfully and did not develop very severe illness. Treatment include uh, experimental drugs, okay, and also antibodies from people who recovered. It's kind of neat, right? You have a person who recovered, the person has antibodies, they take a little bit of a serum, inject into the sick person, sick person becomes better. Okay. Um, now, are we going to have a, we do have a vaccine now. They started clinical trials. Unfortunately, they rolled out the clinical trial too late when outbreak went down. So they got, actually, the data that they got from the vaccine suggests that it's probably very effective. But number of people that uh, were involved, were um, involved in the trial is fairly low by clinical trial standards. So we don't really have a chance to, to, to get a good conclusion about that. Okay, but again, don't worry about Ebola, even if you go to Africa. Okay. So we're going to stop at this point.